G'day ladies and gents and welcome back to Kerbal Space Program with Mags. Today we're taking out the Moon of Five, the latest and last in my Moon series of rockets, and we're heading back to the Mun. While I was beginning experimentation with my new fledgling aeronautical industry, two new contracts became available for the MUN. The first one is to plant a flag in a location different from where we have already planted a flag on the MUN. The second was to pick up a chunk of science and return it to Kerbal Space Center. Now these two contracts pay out enough cash that I will be able to upgrade the vehicle assembly building, so they were too good to pass up. So Jebediah Kerman is once again at the controls. Now the Muna 5 has had a couple of modifications. It's built on the Muna 1 that I've used previously. It still features four SRBs for initial acceleration. However, they have been tuned so that they should run out of fuel just as the thermal shock wave is starting to form. The primary liquid fuel ascent stage has had a different engine fitted. This engine is vastly more powerful, but also more efficient at lower thrust levels. This means I'll be able to put the unit into orbit and still have more fuel in the tank, hopefully enough fuel to complete our orbital maneuver and begin our trip towards the Mun. And the command module has also received a new engine. We're actually using the engine that we used on the Moon of 3 that took Valentina Kerman to Minmus. This was a really good engine, it used very little fuel, left me with a lot left in the tank. However, this time we're taking some landing gear because we are planning on landing. We're also taking atmospheric sensors, temperature sensors, a goo canister, as well as a science bay. So the SRBs run out of fuel right as the thermal shockwave begins power up the primary liquid stage and jettison the tanks, a smooth release. We have also upgraded the control surfaces on the rocket. This has increased stability, no more crashing on SRB release, so we can get rid of that extra weight earlier than we could in the past. The new engine only requires about 50% thrust in order to continue our trip into space. And this does show quite nicely exactly how getting access to higher tech components will make things easier as you go along in career mode. A launch this controlled was almost impossible with the components that I had access to when I first started my trips to the MUN, right at the start of this series of videos. Now it's just a walk in the park. So as we pass 30 kilometers, I increase thrust to 100%. We're now clear of the lower atmosphere. I no longer have to worry about the thermal shock wave or the plasma effects or any form of drag. The atmosphere is much thinner up here. I can begin to punch and accelerate out to orbital velocities. Now I've timed this launch so I should almost be in position to begin my moon burn by the time I hit orbit. There's no real messing around in this particular launch. I want to get this done and get back so I can spend the money, upgrade the VAB and finally get rid of that 30 part restriction on my rockets. Once that's done, I can actually start thinking about space stations and permanent bases on the MUN and Minmus. So just short of 50 kilometers up and I kill the engines, we have enough velocity now that we will proceed out to a apoapsis of around 80 kilometers. Once we hit apoapsis, I'll complete my orbital burn and then hopefully we'll be going directly into my Minmus transfer burn. So a few minutes later and we're ready to begin our orbital burn, I've got Jebediah set to follow prograde. By setting them to follow prograde, make sure that this will always be a nice, smooth, curved burn into orbit. And of course, the bonus of having the Moon of Five fitted with the more powerful engine is this orbital burn doesn't take anywhere near as long. We're already halfway through the burn, with a total burn time of just over 40 seconds, only 20 from the halfway point. So with our orbital burn almost completed, we should have around just under a quarter of a tank left in this main stage. Now again, this does mean that I'll be leaving some space junk once again floating around in orbit, there we go, orbit is achieved. The problem with first gen rockets in career mode, the parts restrictions in the vehicle assembly building and the parts availability that you have via the tech nodes means you generally can't build a rocket with optimized staging. So what you find yourself doing is either releasing space junk, which is what I'm doing, but using the extra fuel that's in the ascent stage in order to complete the first part of the transfer, or you have to release the ascent stage with fuel still in the tanks, suborbital, and then use just the command module to complete the orbit, the transfer, the landing, and the return. Now, of course, you could also try and build a three-stage rocket, but the problem is the vehicle assembly building, while it's set to 30 parts, also has a restriction on the maximum height that the rocket can be built, and this is usually not high enough for you to build an efficient three-stage design. This is why I've been so interested in trying to get the vehicle assembly building upgraded, because once it is upgraded, the parts availability increases from 30, I believe, to 180, giving you a lot more options in that particular area, but also the maximum height that the rockets can be built almost doubles. This allows you to build efficient three-stage designs, allows you to build rockets that can get larger payloads more efficiently into orbit without leaving debris. So with a little bit of time acceleration, we are now in position to begin our moon transfer burn. Now, as you'll see, I didn't actually use the maneuver nodes to plan this burn. There's no reason for it. As I showed in the first episode, just put the moon on the horizon, open up the throttles, and you will get there. 
And there we go, the ascent stage is now fueled out, jettison and activate the primary engine on the command module. Now the command module's engine is not incredibly powerful, however it is incredibly efficient and more than powerful enough for what we need here. The burns themselves will take slightly longer to complete in order to get into position, however you will be using significantly less fuel. This last stage should be more than enough to be able to complete this transfer, complete the landing, the takeoff and the return and still have fuel in the tank in reserve. So only a few seconds left in the burn, and there's our intercept. So easy, it's almost routine. So back to Kerbal Space Center and back to the space plane hangar, and this is what I was actually up to prior to the MUN launch. So this is one day previous to what we've been watching so far. Now I've actually shown a little bit of this already on a previous video, and there was a bit of an argument going on in the comments section. Am I building a MiG-15? Am I building an LA-15? Well, the truth is I'm building both. Building jets in KSP has a couple of unique things that you need to pay attention to, especially if you're planning on using them for something and not just flying around. I'm planning on building a jet that I can put a scientist in, have him fly around Kerbin and pick up all the science from the various biomes. Now the early aircraft components available in KSP actually lead themselves to you building something along the design of a MiG, but there are very particular things that you need. Because you're going to be landing these at various biomes around the planet, you're not going to be landing on a smooth runway, in fact a lot of the time you're going to be landing on the side of a mountain. So there's a couple of things you need to pay attention to. First, you want the landing gear under the wings, which is something you take from the MiG. This gives you a very wide and stable landing base, prevents the aircraft from toppling over on landing. If you put everything on the fuselage, it's possible that it will tip, wing strike and destroy itself. Speaking of wing strikes, having a very low or mid-centered wing increases the chances that if you take off on unstable ground, the aircraft rolling left or right and wing striking, again, ripping off its own wing. So from here, the LA-15's high-mounted wing increases aircraft stability. Now, a common accident that you will have when building early aircraft and taking off in KSP is actually having the elevators or parts of the tail section striking the ground if you've got them mounted to the fuselage. So again, the high mount T-tail off the MiG and the LA-15 suits itself quite nicely here as it keeps those control surfaces away from the ground and reduces the chances that you're going to strike. As for why the elevator is mounted at the top of the rudder, well this is simple utility. Uh, in the aircraft like the MiG-15, there is actually a slot built into the rudder, so as the rudder walks left and right, it won't strike the elevators as they're going up and down. That isn't modelled or fitted into any of the components on KSP, so mounting the elevators at the direct top of the rudder section of the vertical stabiliser, in a position where the rudder will not hit the elevators is just a smart thing to do. So that's the reasons behind the design that I'm using. Now the question is of course, will it work? Now for those of you who are veteran KSP aircraft builders would have noticed that I made one very critical mistake in constructing this aircraft. And honestly it's a little embarrassing that I actually forgot to do it. Now while the veteran KSP builders are punching quickly into my comments section, pointing out where I made this mistake, for those of you who didn't notice it straight away, in both the vehicle assembly building and the space plane hangar, in the bottom left hand corner there is three little buttons you can click. These buttons activate the center of thrust, the center of lift, and the center of mass, little display icons that are overlaid on the aircraft or rocket that you're constructing. So you can see where your mass is, you can see where your aircraft or your rocket is going to generate lift, work out how it's going to fly, and of course where the thrust is driving from to make sure the thrust is pushing down the center of mass. Now as you can see, this plane barely flies. Well, it's actually okay when it gets to level flight, but trying to change its elevation, it's, it's all out of whack. What the hell is going on with this thing? Well, the problem is, it's got a little bit too much control surface on the wing, I over-engineered it slightly there. Um, I was mainly trying to fit in a set of flaps, which honestly I don't think I really need. It's got a great roll rate though. But the biggest issue I run into is the center of lift is actually in front of the center of mass. Now if I had bothered to hit those buttons in the space plane hangar and have a look, I would have noticed immediately that this was the case and realized that this plane was not going to work. It is a rookie mistake and I should not have made it. Now the problem is, I've managed to get a plane that shouldn't fly to fly. Now it's only flying because I'm using SAS at the moment. That tells me straight away that this design is not feasible. I need a scientist to be able to fly this aircraft. That means he won't have access to SAS. This plane needs to be able to fly smoothly and controllably without any outside assistance. But I've got Jebediah in the air here, so I've got to get his ass back on the ground without killing him in a plane that only wants to kill him. 
Now thankfully the plane does get easier to fly over time and this is because as the fuel drains from the tank the back of the aircraft slowly gets lighter moving the center of mass forward eventually the center of mass will get to on top of the center of lift eventually getting in front of the center of lift and stabilizing the aircraft but this is what happens when you have the center of mass of an aircraft behind the center of lift. Jebediah on the other hand seems to be having a wonderful time flying this plane. So it took me a couple of minutes to get the aircraft stable in level flight and start getting into position to try and put it back on the ground. Now as I'm burning fuel the centre of mass is slowly shifting forward and it's getting a little bit easier as I said before. The problem is that jets don't burn a lot of fuel and this thing has a lot of fuel on board. Well at least they don't burn a lot of fuel in comparison to rockets and this thing's fuel tank is actually a rocket tank with the oxidizer removed. So a couple more minutes go by and I've basically been doing aero braking manoeuvres. This aircraft, I currently don't have access to air brakes so I can't fit them to the plane. And it turns out this design actually did pick up a characteristic that the MiG-15 also has. It's a plane that doesn't want to bleed speed. Without air brakes this thing just doesn't want to slow down. Now I'm not going to try and land it on the runway because the runway itself is actually dirt and it is unstable as I haven't upgraded the runway at all. I'm going to land on the grass next to Kerbal Space Centre. Now unfortunately due to having difficulty controlling the aircraft I had to begin my approach closer to Kerbal Space Center than I would have liked. This meant that I'm going to actually overshoot the core cluster of buildings. I'm going to have to descend in between them and I have to land and stop the plane in the gap between the vehicle assembly building and the coast. Might sound easy but I'm going to be touching down at about 230 kilometers an hour and I've only got the brakes fitted to the aircraft to slow it down. No air brakes, no drogue chutes. and we gently put the wheels down at 60 meters per second which is 216 kilometers per hour brakes are on the aircraft doesn't appear to be tipping and thankfully it is going to come to a stop Jebediah lives to fly another day and it's time to put this prototype back in the hangar it looks like we have a little bit more work to do on this one yet so back to the future and Jebediah is just about to enter the Mun sphere of influence and there we go we have our intersect and as you can see we're actually coming in a little bit too shallow on this one our periapsis is actually 14 kilometers below the surface of the Mun so we're going to pancake so what we've got to do is line our rocket up prograde and do a very 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 short burn this will increase our periapsis out of the surface of the MUN and get it into a nice position where we can line up for our deceleration burn into lunar orbit. Now I'm going to do this adjustment burn as soon as possible. The higher away we do this burn from the periapsis, the less fuel we're actually going to burn in completing it. And there we go, the burn is planned. It's only two seconds long. It's only gonna take 42 meters a second of delta V and it will shift our periapsis from negative 14 kilometers to plus 16 kilometers. Now with that little maneuver out of the way we begin setting ourselves up for our deceleration burn into orbit. Now I'm using maneuver nodes here so you can see exactly what I'm up to. Of course you don't need to do them, you can just eyeball these quite easily. However using the maneuver nodes when they are available will increase your accuracy and when you're playing with very small margins of error in terms of fuel, keeping your accuracy high is very 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 important. Now I'm just making some very small adjustments to the maneuver nodes here, I'm trying to line this up as I don't want to complete a full orbit of the Mun, I want to get straight down on the planet. I want to come down on the Kerbin side of the Mun, preferably on the daylight side, somewhere very close to the equator. So I'm setting this burn up so that I will do one half rotation through the dark side of the Mun, come in on the light side and I will be at a position ready to begin my deceleration burn to landing almost straight away. Now I'm keeping the landing zone to the equatorial line for a couple of reasons. Firstly I haven't visited anywhere near all the biomes that are available on the MUN. So it doesn't really matter where I land, I'm going to be landing somewhere where I can pull out the science that I need to complete the mission as well as some extra science for unlocking components and be able to plant the flag quite easily in order to get the money for that and upgrade the VAB. But the other thing I'm looking for at the moment is a Kerbin side of the MUN landing zone that is in a large flat and clear area that I can use as a potential landing spot for a Muna base. Now providing you don't burn off center on your transfer burn, you will always come in on the Muna equator. So putting the base on the equator, it's the easiest point to be able to reliably land spacecraft at once the base is established. So with our maneuver nodes and burns complete, we begin our trip around the dark side of the MUN. Quickly under time acceleration, as I don't want to spend too much time here, we're just looking for the sun to break the horizon. As we clear the surface, up comes a blue marker. That is the landing zone from the last lunar landing. 
Now that particular area was a little bit too rocky for what I was looking for last time, so I'm going to let this travel around a little bit further, and we're going to aim at a nice smooth area between the craters, a little bit further around the surface of the MUN. Now of course I've already planned a node for the descent burn, 10 seconds out and we're ready to engage. 11 second burn at 104 meters per second total, and that will begin our descent to the target area. Now it's slightly off center on the descent, so I'm just going to make a quick adjustment to the blue node. And just do a very short burn here just to fix things up. There we go. So with that burn done, we're just going to let our descent continue through, activate a little bit of time acceleration just to get us there a little bit faster. Continuing to time accelerate until we get down to around four and a half kilometers. Just about time to begin our second deceleration burn. This will bring us into a vertical descent. Just keeping the rocket on retrograde, or the pilot skill set to retrograde. Now I want to progress over the top of these craters and fire almost directly on top of them, so I come down on the flat just past where these craters are. Now I'm carefully watching my horizontal movement speed during this burn. Now I stopped this burn a little early as I was worried I was going to decelerate down onto the ridge line on the edge of that crater, so I let the rocket, or let the command module progress through a little bit further, then restart the burn. down to 122 meters per second in the horizontal 50 meters per second now I bring the horizontal speed down to zero and then shut down the engine and as the rocket begins to descend I just let Jebediah tip it over using the pilot skills extend the landing gear and from this point very short very controlled burns just to keep my descent speed under control now the ideal touchdown speed here is below 8 meters a second, I'm going to try and do better than that. Now at this point the trick is not to constantly use the engine, just short control bursts until we're down to about 300 meters, and then a very slow burn just to maintain descent speed. And once again here, a perfect example of why I run Kerbal Engineer. According to my altitude gauge on the top of the screen, I'm just passing below 2 kilometers, but the reality is I'm only a couple of meters off the ground. My shadow's just become visible, tracking the shadow. 40 meters off the surface. You know, just setting the engines to a constant slow burn, maintaining a descent speed of about 2.5 meters per second, which is well within my threshold. Almost there, and... Touchdown, kill the engines on landing. And there we have it, second moon landing complete. And it looks like we picked a really good area. It's nice, wide and flat. It would be a good area to put down a base. So all we've got to do at this point is jump out, grab a little bit of science, plant a flag and prepare ourselves for our return trip back to Kerbin. But of course, ladies and gents, we'll handle that in the next episode. Until then, click like if you do, subscribe if you want to see more, fly smart, fly safe, and I'll catch you in orbit.